On a strip of sandy soil Lies a county called Norfolk It's Ontario, south coast, you know And it's surely not remote If you pass through or spend a day Or decide to call it home You'll see why we love it here And are proud to call it our own No Take in the small town atmosphere, be amazed at all that we grow. Like our kids that go and see the world and can't wait to return home. Drop a line in a placid lake or stroll along the shore. Take a tour on a peaceful country road. Found to be back for more. Oh no. If we're ready to get going, you can't go wrong. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, I'd like to remind everybody that our meetings are web streamed and televised, and for those in attendance, I would ask that you please ensure your phones are on silent mode. As always, Mr. Jackson is in the back uh, filming for us again this evening, so thank you very much, Mr. Jackson. And uh, thank you all for joining us for this special uh, Board of Health meeting. Uh, the agenda is before you. There is one error uh, or correction that is the change of phrase to be distrusted to to be distributed. As this is a special council meeting, we don't consider additions to the agenda. May I have a mover and seconder? Moved by Councillor Taylor, seconded by Councillor Rabbits. All those in favor? And that's carried. And <laughs> are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Okay, seeing none, uh, first then is uh, staff report HSS 19-42, and that's the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care 2019 Operational Funding for Ontario Seniors Dental Care Program uh, update. So Marlene, I'll let Ma you take it from there. Madam Chair and board members, first of all, thank you for having today's special board meeting, enabling staff to table the report before you. Uh, further to the Board of Health meeting on September the 3rd, of early, um, a few weeks ago, uh, staff have continued the dialogue with the Ministry of Health on the implementation of the Ontario Seniors Dental Care Program and shared the board's feedback of the flexibility of service delivery models within the rural community. Mr. Shaw will present the report before you today and then staff will be happy to answer your, any of the questions of the board. Thank you, Marlene. Madam Chairs and members of Board of Health, I'm going to share three items with you as a follow-up of our Board of Health meeting on September 3rd. The three items are, the first one is the background of the program, the second one is the outcome of our consultation with Ministry of Health, and the third one is the program implementation. So I'm going to briefly explain each point in detail. I'll start with the background. What is this Ontario Seniors Dental Care Program, and how we got to this point? This program is for financially challenged seniors to have access to dental care. The cutoff date, date, uh, age for this program is 65 years or above with an income threshold of $19,300 for a single person or $32,300 for a couple. As you may be aware, during provincial budget, the government announced funding for this program. And in June 2019, the health unit received a letter from Ministry of Health for operational funding of $537,000, which would be prorated for this year. And on September 3rd, we presented a report to Board of Health. And there was a resolution, a resolution to consult with Ministry of Health and Ontario Dental Association. My second point is outcome of our consultation with Ministry of Health. As per your resolution, we did have a discussion with Ministry of Health to discuss about the alternate service delivery models. 
One thing, Ministry was very clear, like fee-for-service is not permitted for this program. But there is a good news. There is a flexibility in exploring other options like partnership contracts that can be sessional, hourly, or per diem basis with a community dentist. We are also meeting with our local community dentists. In our both geographical district, Haldeman and Norfolk, approximately there are 20 dentists. So we met with three of them, including the president for Haldeman and Norfolk Dental Society, and we got their feedback. My third item is the program implementation. Ministry is directing us to have some service available as early as October 15th. They are going to start up the application process from October the 1st, where the, where the applicants or the seniors, they can apply, and then there would be an eligibility criteria, and the ministry is going to finalize that. And for eligible uh, seniors, they are going to issue them the dental card. But the ministry is asking us to start some kind of a service delivery by October 15. As you may be aware, the health unit doesn't have the necessary infrastructure to support elderly dental care. We do have a program for our children that is Healthy Smiles Ontario, but our dental suites, they, they do not support dental care for elderly people. So to, we have to find a way and to effectuate this, the best possible option is to have partnership contracts with community dentists. Having said that, I have three recommendations for the Board of Health. My first one is to, to give us an exemption to procurement policy to permit a modified procurement process. The second one is the Board of Health approves recruitment of a 0.5 program assistant. This position will help us in application process, interface with partners, managing OHIS, that is a dental software program, and coordinating with patients in terms of, in terms of scheduling and follow-up. And my third recommendation is the Board of Health writes a letter to educate for dental funding and explore and utilize effective and efficient service delivery models to meet local rural needs. So with this, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if you may have. Okay, thank you, sir. Questions from councillors? <clears throat> or board members, rather? I guess I have a couple. So in terms of the exemption to the procurement policy, um, I'm just... I'm wondering how we came to the selection of the couple of dentists that we, we are using, if we put out a communication soliciting interest from all dentists across Norfolk County. So, um, Madam, Madam Chair, at this point we haven't made those selections. We're going to have a modified procurement process just because of the tight timeline, but there will be some set criteria, and then we will select those dentists and we'll have it open to all of the dentists across the region. So at this point we have not specifically selected any um, dentists or even the amount of dentists that will be okay. utilized in moving so forward. So all dentists across Norfolk County will have the opportunity to express their interest and then from there yeah. we'll narrow the scope. Madam Chair to the Board, that is correct. We are working with our dental association and our procurement team to ensure that, um, that we do capture all dentists across the regions. Okay. And then the next question is, in terms of this sort of change from the government and the flexibility for exploring other options, is that derived out of the conversations then you've had with that's in general, or this is because of us kind of pushing back? That uh, Madam Chair, if I may, to the board, I think it's a combination of both. We've been having those conversations uh, with the ministry for quite some time, um, not just um, Norfolk County staff, but also um, other um, representatives um, from other boards across the province, um, where the service delivery implementations timelines have been almost restrictive. So between all of our um, colleagues across the province and then our feedback after we, after we had our board meeting on the 3rd, I would suggest that collectively um, the ministry has enabled the flexibility. Um, it, please note, though, that this is an interim flexibility. We will continue to advocate hence the letter before you for your consideration and draft um, to continue. We will be evaluating the program in six months and we will continue to advocate for the flexibility in the service model to meet our local needs. I'm sorry, I don't think I actually I hadn't read the letter. Um, then the, um, the only other question I have then in regards to uh, the point five of the program assistant, um, I mean, just to, to put this 
we all know with the speech pathologists that some of the changes that we've experienced internally recently, we're going to see if we're able to fill that from kind of an internal source here right now before. Yeah. So, Madam Chair, further to our uh, conversation that we've had, we are exploring that. Okay. Um, we're asking board approval today to provide us with the opportunity um, to approve the full-time 0.5 FTE. Okay. Sounds good. Councillor or uh, board member Taylor. Rabbits. Losing my mind, sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through you to our staff presenting this report. Um, my question is, uh, it is stated in the report on the first page that the health unit does not have the necessary infrastructure for elderly dental care. And so I'm assuming that the uh, provision of this service will take place at those dental offices that we are um, partnering with. Uh, my question to you is, are we also considering those that don't have a regular dental practice? I know with specifically with elderly dental care, there are some organizations that provide just um, the dentures or they provide dental hygiene services, but they don't necessarily provide those other dental care in terms of the cleaning, the checkups, and they just focus specifically on, um, again, the, the dental, um, the, the, the false teeth, the things of that nature. Would those also be included in uh, our solicitation efforts? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, members of the Board of Health. So when we think of dental services for, uh, uh, for older people, there's a spectrum of services. And um, the individuals that are in our population that are going to be served by this program, there are about a 1,000 of them. There are individuals we anticipate, and in our dialogue with community dentists, and from my own experience, Experience, people that have not had dental care are going to probably be more challenging and resource intense than people who have always had a dentist and are now going to this program. We anticipate that there will be some services that are emergency services. So the two most common reasons why people present to the dentist emergently in this population group are having broken teeth or infected teeth. And so we have to provide that level of service. The mandate is also to provide cleaning uh, or sort of, uh, you know, preventative services, and that includes cleaning of teeth. It also includes basic restorative service like services, like filling cavities and extractions. And it does, for the, uh, to your point, it includes dentures. Sorry I got to it in a long-winded way. So it covers that full spectrum of dental care. I think that, you know, as we go through the process to select per service providers, there has to be a provision for dental, uh, for denture services, and, the, uh, and all the services that are within reason provided. Now, Dentura services are probably going to be included as part of that program. How it's going to be finally effectuated, I think, is still a little bit of a, of a, of a challenge. At least in the first instance, I would be reluctant. I would think it's not optimal for us to only have one provider provide cleaning and another provider to provide dental, like extractions. And so my preference, and although it's not definitive, my preference would be for when the beneficiary goes to the dental service provider, that they get all the services they need with as little disruption as possible. Now, that is one concern of mine uh, as we formulate the program. But we're open to dialogue, and you know we would definitely um, ask others to help us with this. The one thing I would share is we have met with uh, the uh, three dentists in the community. There are only 20 dentists. We understand there are only 20 dentists in practice in Haldeman and Norfolk. We're going to be meeting with the Dental Society to get their intake. We've been invited to the meeting uh, of their next meeting. And with that, we'll be better informed to answer those granular questions. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Doctor. Absolutely, it does. It sounds like we're after the full uh, slate of services. And I do know there's additional cost in transferring medical records between offices. And so there may be a, an economy of scale and only looking at those that can offer the full gambit of services rather than um, sort of sh shopping out our clients depending on their need. So I can see a lot of logic behind that. Uh, my follow-up question to you would be, what sort of incentives can we provide to uh, those partners to actually participate in the program? Are we able to write them a taxable benefit? Is there any um, other incentives that we could look at as a municipality um, to, to get those doctors on board, appreciating they all have uh, a lot of clients on their list uh, and we do have somewhat of a, a shortage in dentists and doctors in Norfolk County in, in general. 
Um, and I do know that there's, there's quite a, a long line for those to get a family doctor or to get a dentist. Many are traveling out of the area for those services. And I know that some of our um, practitioners might be hesitant to take on this additional workload with that in mind. Is there any way that we can incentivize them to participate in this new program? So, uh, Madam Chair, uh, members of the Board of Health, uh, I think those are very uh, uh, fair uh, points. We are concerned. Um, in our dialogue with uh, community dentists, one of the things that they had shared with us is that the, the compensation paradigm has to be consistent with the amount of uh, overhead and other input costs that they have to running their practices. So at least as this interim solution, if I could share, we're, at, we're trying to focus on an interim solution uh, and, uh, and then a long-term solution. But this interim solution would have to have, we would anticipate some fair compensation paradigm so that they would feel that, it's a, that they can manage their practices uh, with these uh, patients. We also want the patients, like every program, want the patients to benefit and the practitioners to benefit and the community benefit. So I think that would be the uh, one incentive. Secondly, at least from my experience, many dentists have patients currently uh, that cannot pay and they continue to treat them. And many dentists, in fact, are very publicly minded, have public service uh, mindset. So um, I think that we'll get their support. I, in, in our dialogue, at least in the dialogue I've had up to this point, I think the community dentists are supportive of being included in the program. Board Member Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair, through you to staff. Um, one thing that does keep worrying me, I know it has, I've talked to you multiple times about it, uh, the emergency situations. Um, I'm afraid that when someone has an emergency come up that's using the service, they're gonna wait two weeks, three weeks, whatever it is, for the services to come back. Um, is there going to be a way that we communicate, like if you do chip a tooth, if you do think you have a gum infection, that here's the list of dentists in the community, like you need to go see someone instead of waiting to come back because there's a whole slew of liability issues that would come with that and also, you know, just the health of the community. So Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, uh, it's clearly a concern of ours. Um, uh, if I could share private, uh, no, it's not private, if I could share with you that we always worry about how we're going to effectuate this plan in a way that's consistent with the regulatory construct in Ontario, the College of Dentists. Uh, so as, as we formulate the program, we need to have a provision for the timely, pr uh, uh, timely delivery of emergency dental services for these, uh, uh, these beneficiaries. And it has to be in compliance with whatever appropriate rules and regulations. So, uh, uh, and as you had pointed out, that if we articulate that we have emergency services, we really have to have an availability for emergency services. Uh, we are happy to report back our team as we have more details. And, we, and I think the Dental Association is also concerned about that service availability. Love to hear their feedback when we have it. Thank you. Just to, as a follow-up to that, I mean, <clears throat> it is, it's a half a million, the funding? Like, it's pretty limited as well from what there is there to work with. Um, I guess the only other question that I had, um, in terms of, I mean, obviously we're talking about a massive geographic area between Haldeman and Norfolk, and I think you said we were going to three? Is that what? So, Madam Chair, we haven't um, come to that conclusion uh, yet. Okay. Once we issue um, the um, procurement, we will see what comes back and then we'll make those determinations and we'll try to identify uh, those areas that we were likely going to serve um, so we ensure access for patients. So okay. um, we're looking at likely Simcoe, uh, Caledonia and Dunville would probably be our, our three target areas, um, but we haven't confirmed that at this point in time. Okay, um, so I'm just kind of curious in terms of once we narrow sort of the areas that, that we, want it, we want these dentists to be located and so on, um, is there going to be sort of a selection committee? Who's going to determine from the, the expressions of interest of local dentists? Uh, so, Madam uh, Chair, uh, we'll work with our procurement team and we will have a selection uh, based on the criteria. We're still establishing that, um, given the timelines, though, we're, we just needed to get to the board as today was our last opportunity. Um, but we will have a selection committee um, to determine what dentists will be uh, providing the service moving forward. Okay. 
And should this carry on, should we be able to continue with this model, there will be an opportunity for us to kind of reevaluate who's providing the services and so on. So, uh, Madam Chair, the intent is, is to evaluate the program as we move along and then to provide that evaluation to the ministry and to the board um, so that we can determine how to proceed. If this model or a similar model is um, the decision moving forward, a full procurement process would be uh, undertaken. Okay. Any further questions? So I have a motion uh, moved by Councillor Rabbits and seconded uh, by Councillor Columbus as printed in your agenda. Is that sufficient for everyone or did you need me to read it? It's okay. All those in favor? And that's carried. And finally, a motion moved. Uh, is there anything further from? Oh, sorry. So, uh, Madam Chair, thank you for the approval and from the board. Um, just wondering if there was any additional commentary related to the letter. It is in draft format for your consideration. Um, and if there is any additions or changes, um, staff would be happy to incorporate those um, according to the board's wishes. And then have um, you, Madam uh, Chair, uh, sign off and send the letter. Um, I personal perspective, I mean, I think it's fine. I, I think it could be maybe a little bit more, more kind of hard hitting, I suppose, like explaining to, to really articulate the challenges that we face with that amount of money over, you know, 3,000 square kilometers and the fact that it's probably not feasible for us to provide those services. So if I may, uh, Madam Chair, we'll revise it and um, provide it to you um, for if the board is agreeable to have you sign off on that and then we will issue the letter. Okay. Perfect. I see heads nodding. So that's great. Thank you. Uh, board Member Martin. Uh, thank you, Chair, Madam Chair. I, j I have a, a question um, not related to an agenda item, but if, if, if the board will allow it. Uh, Councillor or Board Member Rabbits had a perfect segue when he touched on um, shortages of doctors in the community. And I know I've had this discussion with you before, but I had an interesting phone call again today uh, from uh, healthcare providers who aren't participating in, in the walk-in clinic. And um, what is the municipality doing to recruit uh, physicians to to the county I spoke about um, how your team is assisting private enterprises working on that uh, but I wondered if you could just comment on that publicly for anyone else who's at home watching or provide me with extra information that I can bring back regarding that uh, through um, the board chair um, to the board um, primary care is not typically like the recruitment of primary care is not typically a municipal business that we undertake uh, however having said that we do recognize that there is a primary care shortage across Haldeman Norfolk so we have been working primarily with the Port Dover group um, for several years now and over those last few years the Port Dover Medical Center has recruited four physicians um, so those four physicians do continue and uh, to practice in Port over. Um, additionally, we are aware that there are two new physicians in uh, the wellness center here in Simcoe as well. So that is six additional primary care practitioners across um, Norfolk. I can't speak specifically to Haldeman today. Um, the other thing is, is that from a recruitment perspective, the hospital actually has a liaison person who is solely responsible for um, primary care physician and physician recruitment um, and they have been actively working and actually worked with us when we were working with the Port Dover group um, to secure uh, their recruitment into the region. Um, and for those people who don't have a primary care physician, if those six physicians are no longer taking, um, position, um, taking um, patients, um, there is a program through the LIN. So the, uh, the LIN does have a program called Healthcare Connect um, and their sole role is to connect people to primary care of those um, physicians who are accepting uh, new patients. So if you go online or if you call the LIN, uh, you, can co you can get connected and they'll work with you to try to connect you to primary care. Thank you. Anything further from anyone? Okay, thanks Marlene. Um, okay, with that then, I have a motion moved by Councillor Geisens and seconded by Councillor Rabbits. Uh, that bylaw 2019-8 uh, BH being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Special Board of Health for Haldeman Norfolk Health Unit at this Board of Health meeting held on the 17th day of September 2019 be approved and signed by the Mayor and Clerk. All those in favor? And that's carried. And the motion to uh, adjourn the uh, Special Board of Health meeting moved by Council Board Member Martin, seconded by Board Member Michelli. All those in favor? And that's carried.
Okay. Um, we'll now open our uh, council meeting. The agenda is before you, and we have the addition of uh, one closed session item and a number of revisions to the minutes before you. Uh, can I have a motion to approve the agenda as amended? Councillor Taylor. That, oh, you're making a motion to approve it. Gotcha. Seconded by Councillor Rapids. All those in favor? That's carried. Um, I should actually add as well at the beginning of the meeting here, um, we did hear from uh, Councillor Huffman, who's not in attendance this evening, uh, but she has just informed us that she is actually going to be um, stepping down due to time constraints through the election uh, campaign period. So uh, I don't think we'll see her then until um, after the election takes place. Uh, Councillor Martin. My apologies, Mayor Chop. I would actually like to pull um, a report for discussion. The minutes, um, Recreation Facility Board on page 65, it's 8E, um, or it is item 8, also 8E on our revised package. So, you, so the, just the minutes that you're looking to pull. So we actually have that. We've got with the revised minutes 7A, 8B, D, and E. Through you, Mayor. If there's any resolutions within the minutes, I think I printed them off. So once we get to the minutes, you can d discuss them. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, Councillor Michelli, it's the board member, Councillor thing that's getting me right now. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I'm not sure if this would be the appropriate time. I just have a couple of corrections to make to some of those same minutes. Or should well, I wait until we approach well, them? when we get to the minutes. That's perfect. Okay, consent or declarations of uh, pecuniary interest. Any? Councillor Van Passen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I still have the conflict on number 19 from the Council and Committee minutes on page 45. So that's why that item has been pulled so it can be dealt with separately. Okay, very good. And anyone else? Okay, seeing nothing else, we'll move on to the consent items. We have two consent items on the agenda. Does any member wish to pull any item uh, for discussion? Okay, in that case, I have a motion moved by Councillor Columbus and seconded by Councillor Rabbits that consent items A and B be approved uh, as published. Any discussion on those? All those in favor? And that's carried. First presentation, we have uh, Mr. Chevalli with us here from the uh, Police Services Board uh, to make a presentation on false alarms and council's policing priorities that I'm sure he will remind us that we have not done yet. And so a uh, reminder, Mr. Chevalli, um, your presentation is limited to 10 minutes, if you can. Um, Thank you very much, you your worship. Members of council. Um, over to my right at the back here, we have our Chief of Police, uh, Inspector Joe Varga, and Staff Sergeant John Flashing. Fashion. <laughs> it's an old German term for me, fashion. It's a holiday over there. Um, so I'm here tonight to uh, make a presentation on uh, a false alarms policy proposal to you. Uh, this was presented to the uh, Police Services Board uh, on the 4th of September, uh, the mayor was in attendance and uh, participated in some of the questions that were presented to the, um, to the um, Municipal Policing Bureau who were in attendance as well. And, and all of you should have received notes from me coming out of that meeting. Uh, on the slide in front of you, uh, this is the uh, original objectives that we hope to achieve, and that was to stop unnecessary police responses to false alarms. Uh, to save police time and resources for their more important priority issues, and to reduce the calls for service. I was hoping to say that we could reduce our policing costs uh, through this process, but at that, that meeting with the Municipal Policing Bureau, uh, that there was no guarantee that that would happen because we receive a percentage of all the calls across Ontario for those municipalities that use the OPP. However, what is not on that slide and uh, was presented, uh, Bill Cridlin was in attendance with Nikki Sloat from his uh, division, that if you accept this proposal, that it would greatly reduce 
staff administrative time and effort over in the CSD. Correct, Bill? Yeah. So that's the proposal that we have. What I'm going to go through very quickly here are, um, and hopefully it will change, any staff assistance. Thank you very much. It's the Toronto example. And uh, the Toronto Police Service, uh, as of September the 10th last year, respond only to verified alarms, burglar alarms. And statistics will tell you that over 95% of burglar alarms are false alarms. Over 95%. Burglar alarm activations include alarms from detectors such as motion detectors, door detectors, glass, uh, and window break, uh, those types of things in a, in a commercial business or house setting. Verified, the next one there, please. Oh, there we go. Jeez, this thing works sometimes and it doesn't work other times. Um, verified means an audible, audible device. So you, you hear something happening in the house or the premises, a video device, an eyewitness, either a private security person on the scene or the house owner or the premises owner themselves or a neighbor, and multiple zone activation. So not only the door alarm went off, but motion detectors within the, the premises also went off. Now... Okay, what is not included in the verified portion are panic alarms, activations, not limited to hold up or duress, those kinds of things. So those will still be absolutely responded to in the first instance. Uh, verified uh, activations and panic alarms will be continued to be treated as high priority as necessary uh, and dispatched uh, accordingly according to the priority list that the uh, police may have at the time. The Canadian uh, Security Association, CANASA, uh, and monitoring stations that are registered with the Toronto Police Service were informed of the change in policy with respect to verified response requirements. That's the policy portion. Specifically, that a verified response requirement would only be applied to burglar alarm activations after September the 10th, 2018. So they've had almost a year, a little over a year, sorry, uh, of this uh, program in place. And I've been in touch with them from uh, a few months now, as well as uh, the executive director of CANASA and uh, the um, uh, Hamilton Police Force and a uh, person in Guelph and the executive director for the Association in Ontario for Police Service Boards. And there is a movement in this direction. And in fact, CANASA, the monitoring stations and the alarm companies that belong to CANASA, are in fact are preemptively moving in this direction. So in the Toronto situation, the alarm station must be registered with the Toronto Police Services. It must not be under suspension, according to the bylaw that's in place. It has complied with the verification process and the monitored premises and or alarm system is not under suspension from police re response. Now that may raise a bit of concern by some people, but I assure you that the Toronto Police Service, uh, the bylaw as well as the uh, policy underwent rigorous legal review. Now, what the outcome might be here in Norfolk may be different, but we'll get to that at the penultimate slide. The Toronto Police Service will not respond to requests from alarm monitoring stations that are not registered with them, where the operator fails to provide a valid alarm company identification number, uh, the alarm monitoring station has to be suspended for service, uh, and uh, from alarm monitoring stations for premises that have been suspended for service. Alarm systems that use an automatic dialing device and or pre-recorded messages will not be responded to, and I don't think that that's... Uh, I think that's the norm for across uh, Canada right now. The, the automatic dialers are gone the day of the dodo bird. And any alarms that do not meet the required, or sorry, a verified response criteria. Now, it's important to note that, uh, again, that this went un underwent rigorous legal review by the, 
before the Toronto Police put it in place. Um, and uh, as I said, I've discussed this matter with them, with CANASA, uh, with the Association of Police Services Boards and other uh, police, uh, police agencies. Um, so what are the benefits of adopting a similar get ahead of ourselves here. Uh, the calls for service will dramatically drop for false burglar alarms. Fewer time-consuming responses made by police officers. The officers have more time to spend on crime prevention and law enforcement. So if you go back to uh, the Police Services Act of 1990, which is in effect right now, the, the priorities that they give, the top two are crime prevention and law enforcement. And CSD staff, as I mentioned earlier, uh, their administrative staff uh, will have more time to dedicate to other important services. In 19, uh, sorry, in 2018, here in Norfolk County, there were 786 alarm calls. That's an average of 66 a month. Go back to the statistic that not over 95% are false. The number is impressive. Here's the ask, if we can get there, there we go. We would like Norfolk County to approve the concept and direct staff to work with the Police Services Board and the OPP to one, revise the current bylaw and two, draft a new Norfolk County alarms policy. That's the ask. The next steps that would follow, if you agree with that, would be that Norfolk County Police Services Board members, Norfolk County staff, and the OPP, we would uh, meet, go through the revisions, the review and the revisions of the policy and the, uh, sorry, sorry, the current bylaw and uh, uh, draft a new policy. And we would bring that forward uh, no later than the 31st of December of this year. And then council can uh, look at it and say, yes, we like it very much, and give us an implementation date. Uh, I should add also that before you see it, if you agree to it, uh, legal counsel for Norfolk County will also review it. So it will give you that comfort level that you need around this table. Uh, Norfolk County and the Police Services Board will work with the Ontario Association of Police Service Boards to uh, inform other OPP municipalities of the policy and the benefits. The reason for that is that if we can get other municipalities to adopt the same approach, as I said, the alarm monitoring stations are doing that uh, preemptively, but if we can get other municipalities to adopt it, then the calls for service across Ontario will drop, and there may well be a reduction in costs. We're not too sure. The uh, Municipal Policing Bureau of the OPP indicated in their presentation that their budget for municipal policing is $400 million. If we dramatically reduce calls for service, then hopefully our percentage would drop and the fees would drop, but that's not a guarantee. We were told that quite, quite clearly, there's no guarantee of that. So with that, Madam Mayor, I have finished my presentation and I leave it up to you. Any questions that the uh, councillors may have? Thank you, sir. Councillor Columbus. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, thank you, Mr. Trevally, for your presentation on behalf of the Police Services Board. I have a question with respect to the Toronto situation. Do you, uh, do you know of how effective that has been? It's been in, in place for a year. Do you have any statistics to show the drops, the number of uh, incidents that have dropped for false alarms? Yeah. They were hesitant to give me actual numbers, the term they use was a significant reduction. As you can imagine, in the city of Toronto, uh, not, not the GTA, but the city of Toronto, there, there may be tens of thousands of alarm systems out there. And at 97% being a false alarm rate, that's significant. And the term they used was significant reductions. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Councillor Martin and then Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Chop. Um, thank you, Mr. Trevally, for the presentation and also for offering to uh, 
work on the bylaw. Because that's very helpful. Mm. Just has to basically. I'll come do it back. on my vacation. Just time. has to come back to us. That's great. <laughs> um, th my only question that I wonder if you could touch on is um, the comparison between Toronto and Norfolk County uh, geographically. We're, we're significantly different. There's uh, more of an aging population here, and um, it might be a little while for your neighbor to recognize an alarm going off and verify it. Are there any comments or other municipalities that you've touched base with that could help um, just fill, it, fill us in on what that verification would look like if you lived in a rural area? Yeah, let me start by saying there is no intention whatsoever for the Norfolk detachment of the OPP to not go to a call for service. No intention whatsoever. So if an alarm goes off and the onus then shifts to the monitoring station to ask those questions to try at their very best to verify is it a good alarm or a bad alarm? And as you say, the, the neighbor may not jump in. My retort to that is we don't run to every car alarm that's going off. And a lot of people hear them. You know, so uh, I think if we shift that onus to the monitoring station to do their best to verify that it is a valid alarm, uh, then the call comes in and the OPP or the police service will respond. There's no intention to tell them not to do so. If, uh, uh, okay, go ahead, sorry. I'll stop there. Okay, <laughs> Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and through you to uh, Mr. Trevally. You made a comment about there being suspended alarms and there wouldn't be a response. Just curious, what gets an alarm suspended? How do you get it unsuspended? Those sorts of things. Yeah, I can only sort of hypothesize at this point, because uh, we'd have to go through the discussions with staff and with the OPP, but let's say that there is one particular premises that in a month has three. And then the next month they have another three. And, that, and I know of one, through speaking to, to Nikki Sloat, there's one that has 20. And you're going to have to do something to, to say, no, that's too many. That's enough. We're not coming to every time you call us. We're not coming anywhere. A little bit of research has to be done on that. But the liability aspect of that has to be researched as well. So I, I want to be very careful before we come back to council with any kind of a, a bylaw adjustment or, and or policy on those issues. That one that's having 20 right now, is it currently suspended or all of those no, being responded no. to? No, I don't want to get into the, to the detail of how the system is set up, but that individual paid a registration fee, so they get a lesser penalty for all the subsequent ones after three, and they get three strikes before anything happens. And, and that's another problem with the current bylaw. It's just too much allowance for false alarms. Thank you. And what I will say, too, if I might, may, Madam Mayor, on this point is it will be up to the uh, responding police officer to say, I see no evidence of a break-in. I see no evidence of, of something uh, nefarious happening here. And the reason we want to have both a bylaw and a policy is so that then that, the, that, that report by the, uh, uh, the officer can go back to CSD staff and if it is a false alarm, we would like to write a penalty in the bylaw. So, as well, uh, we don't want to see the police officers responding to an environmental alarm at a chicken barn. You know, we don't want to see them responding to an environmental alarm at a, at a tobacco kiln. So, hence, give us the verifications and whatnot. It still will not stop them from responding if the call comes in. Then that's where you know, that doesn't fit into the policy, doesn't fit into the bylaw, so there will be a false alarm tick against your name and you will be penalized one way or another. Uh, Councillor um, Rabbits. Councillor Columbus had a question. Rabbits and Van Passen and uh, Martin. Got it. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, through you, I think my question may be directed towards the clerk, but... Um, Mr. Tavalli may be able to answer it. Is the bylaw, the current bylaw that we're uh, anticipating reviewing, is it bylaw number 1-08 that's being the bylaw um, imposing fees and charges for services activities uh, by the Ontario Provincial Police? Is there any other bylaw that would be affected or is that the one no, under I, review? In fact, I had a hand in writing that when I was a, a civilian, if you wish, and I had a hand in writing the original original police, uh, original bylaw, and that's a bylaw 0108 by the Police Services Board 
issued under the auspices of Norfolk County. So it's a police services board bylaw. We, we are not a police services board, as I told you previously in my presentations, we're not a committee of council. We stand alone under section 10 of the Police Services Act. So that's the only one that will be affected to answer your question. Yes. Councilor Ambassador. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I think my question has been answered that uh, I was going to make sure there was a difference between the criminal type burglar alarms in the residential units and the environmental alarms that are on chicken barns, yep. dairy barns, hog barns, uh, tobacco kills. There's all sorts of them. Yep. We don't want to waste resources on those either. No, uh, no. And I don't want to get into a discussion with you on raccoons or uh, <laughs> anything else. <laughs> I've been there before. Councilor <laughs> Martin? Anything further from anyone? Oh, Councilor Close. I do have a question for the clerk. Okay, can I ask that or do we just wait? Why not? Okay, uh, Mr. Clerk, uh, Andy, uh, the, on behalf of the Police Services Board, uh, Dennis here is asking for revision of the current bylaw and a draft a new Norfolk County Alarms Policy to replace bylaw number 1 08. And do you feel it uh, doable by the 31st of December to have this type of uh, new program implemented? Or maybe that goes to Mr. Cridlin. I don't know. Through you, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, the, um, I talked with uh, Owen Jagert, uh, who's with the Police Services Board, and, and he um, feels very confident in his ability to work with Mr. Trevally. Uh, Chair Trevally, sorry, and and, uh, and the Police Services Board in crafting the bylaw. I think yep. the more complicated uh, aspect of it is I don't know how CSD's internal processes work. So there, there, the, there's an administrative side, the bylaw side. My uh, my staff are, are willing to assist and get that done, no problem. Okay, you have a bylaw draft or a motion in front of you there, I believe, that I signed with respect to this uh, issue. Have you? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Could we have that read to see if it uh, meets the requirements? That uh, sure. Tried? That community services staff be directed to work with the police services board upon false alarm uh, processes and work back to council, report back rather to council in committee with a final proposal that has been reviewed by the police services board in January of 2020. Is that doable? Yep. Okay. I, I guess that the only other thing just that I might maybe add is in terms of we're going to establish a set fine? Yes, as we move forward, all the discussions around uh, any penalty, discussions around certainly legal advice going forward. Uh, and one point I want to raise specifically, and that is nowadays you can monitor your own alarm. Not, not going through a monitoring station anymore. They have ring, uh, you know, TV, uh, CCTV cameras in doorbells, all that kind of stuff. So we will take into account all of those technological changes as well. Would we need to add to this the ability of um, Chair Trevally to work with the county solicitor if he needs legal advice in, in crafting that penalty, not only the penalty, but also how we're going to collect the fine? Because so far our collection process hasn't really been working all that well. So maybe this is an opportunity to refine how we're going to do that. Mm -hmm. Anything that we can do to streamline the process and make it more effective and efficient is good. So if we can add, if the clerk can add something of that nature in there, that'd be great. We also are, it's very important to include the alarm monitoring companies in this whole discussion before we come forward because they're going to, they're, they, not only with the, the OPP, Norfolk OPP and the county, but they are going to have to be quite actively involved in this, uh, implementing this new, new bylaw. Okay. And on that particular point, uh, to, through you, Madam Mayor, Canassa, the executive director, uh, Mr. Patrick Straw and I have been talking for some months now. They will be involved uh, in talking to Nikki Sloat uh, and my, uh, my knowledge of what's happening uh, it, over there. Uh, there are well over 150 alarms registered with Nikki Slope. And that's an annual process, reviewing all of that, dealing with the false alarms with all of those. Once we move to alarm monitoring stations, you're probably down to 12. So it will be much more efficient. Councilor Ampassan. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, 
I'm getting confused, but maybe that's because I read part of this. Uh, why is it going through community services if the person in the bylaw who's responsible for it would be the chief building official? One or the other should change, right? Yeah, the bylaw would be a police services board bylaw, and, and that, the policy side where it de determines uh, the administrative activity has always been with CSD. If council wishes to change that, you know, <laughs> that's your prerogative. But Nikki Schlotz has been doing a tremendously bang up job for the last, well, 12, 13 years, uh, 19 years, you know, type of thing, it's from day one. Yeah. That's why I'm confused, because the definition of county in here is, yeah. shall mean the chief building official manager of bylaw division for the county and his or her designate. So yep. <coughs> is that the one that should change to community services? That'll or be <laughs> should we deal with it through the planning? Or the That'll be part of the discussion going forward, Councillor. Yep. So, um, Councillor Van Passen? One other little complaint. Not complaint. <laughs> uh, observation. Observation. <laughs> right. uh, on the proposed fees, uh, annual registration fee is $45. You get the first false alarm free. The second one, if you're registered, you got to pay 75. If you're unregistered, you got to pay 100. Now, I would suggest you change 75 to 55 to make it the same cost as a $100 unregistered one because you've paid 45 bucks for to register and then you're going to get ding $75. You better to not register and pay the 100. Yeah. Chair Tavalio, iron out the that, common sense. In that, that whole part of the current bylaw will be under revision as well. And if we move to the alarm monitoring stations responsibility and, uh, and their uh, liability, there will be one set, and that's it. Because whether you're registered or not, a false alarm is a false alarm. And, and a collection cost, method, too. And it's costing police resources. And if we want to get down to the hourly... Uh, cost of a police officer or two going to a false alarm that may determine how we set the upset of the uh, of the uh, penalty okay. anything further okay uh thank you sir appreciate it thank you so councillor columbus would you like me to read your motion for you again in addition so if you could please i appreciate it uh, that community services staff and our in-house council be directed to work with the police services board upon false alarm processes as well as establishing fines and collection methods and report back to council and committee with a final proposal that has been reviewed by the police services board in january 2020. that was seconded by councillor rabbits does that work okay any further discussion all those in favor and that's carried Okay, so uh, the next are two uh, communication items. Does anybody wish to pull any of the communication items? Once. Okay, so actually maybe we'll just uh, first of all receive communication item A. Uh, we've got uh, Councillor Columbus has moved that and it's been seconded by uh, Councillor Rabbits. All those in favor? And the second is uh, communication item B, uh, which I don't believe it's directed at me this time, so I think I get to speak about it. Um, I, uh, I just wanted to clarify for Council um, a couple of points in Mr. Mascarin's uh, first supplementary report, he stated that I did not respond uh, to him uh, by the deadline, and that was um, that was uh, publicly distributed. In fact, I have a copy of the sent email from my own inbox leaving to him, and it was prior to uh, his deadline. I thought it was curious again on this occasion that he also sent an email to council um, stating that. Uh, I had earlier received a copy of the supplementary report and I guess earlier in his world must mean seconds before because I also have the email showing that both of them were received, uh, the one that went to council and to myself at um, exactly the same time. 
what I would be curious, um, and I think that the public has a right to know at this point, is um, what um, the cost of uh, certainly the, the initial investigation, uh, or report rather, I should say, uh, as well as the additional supplementary reports. I think that um, given the uh, public attention to the matter, that um, if we uh, could provide perhaps direction to the clerk to be able to provide uh, that bill to council. Uh, through you, uh, Madam Chair, yes, uh, of course, there's there's no problem if uh, council wants uh, me to provide a, a breakdown of the uh, integrity commissioner's uh, various uh, works. I can do that. Um, some of the bills haven't come in yet. Um, I did provide kind of a brief analysis before earlier in this year, and the amount at that time was around the, the $29,000, $30,000 mark on this item. Um, so. Um, we can give a full breakdown of all the, the different items. Uh, it, it might have some information missing because there, there was a period where there were confidential uh, complaint processes and, and that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, well, even with the confidential complaint process, there should still be a record of, of the complaint itself. Um, I guess the other piece, and just wondering, so and perhaps, Andy, if you might be able to comment on this, but what sort of surprised me is that uh, the Simcoe reformer received uh, notice or a copy, rather, of the supplementary report before it had been um, included in the agenda. So there was a ra relatively small group of people that would have had access uh, to that. Um, and so I'm just wondering um, if you might have any comments on, of, of that nature, if you would agree with that timeline that I've observed. Through you, uh, Mayor, yes, uh, I believe it was just a couple staff members and, and council, uh, myself, the, the acting CAO and council that had that copy before it was published about six hours after it was published in the Simcoe Reformer. So just um, as a reminder to any council members and staff that um, I think we've, we've seen this situation recently as well with a, a public works um, draft report that has been discussed with uh, developers um, that these matters are confidential until they do uh, be, fall into the public domain. So despite the fact that that was only a 24 hour period ahead of time and it was going to become public, it was not in fact public at that point in time to be distributed to the newspaper. So uh, with that, if I could have a motion to, unless there's anything further from anyone. Councilor Martin. Thank you, Mayor Top. I just have a quick question, uh, maybe through to the clerk. Can we expect all of the integrity commissioner's matters to be considered open until Mr. Mascaren um, reports that the matter is, is concluded, which is his, his uh, final statement on this report? I asked the question because, you know, should there not have been something that he needed to follow up on. I'm just wondering if we can always anticipate a second, third, or fourth report coming to him and charging us to notify that the report is now concluded. Uh, I'd say that through you, uh, Mayor Chop, that, that's a valid question, but it's probably a question to be asked of the Integrity Commissioner. Um, it's a qualified answer. I guess it would cost us another $700 an hour to be able to ask him. Councillor Van Passen. Well, I, I read this one. This matter has now been concluded. The previous one, the closing line is, I remain appraised of this matter. That means he's still working on it. This means he's done. It's, it's interesting that he, he comments that um, council has acted without uh, his consent, and yet I'm not sure that council gave the consent for this final report. Uh, with that, if I could have a motion to uh, move that John Mascaren Integrity Commissioner's communication regarding supplemental report be received as information. Councillor Rabbits and seconded by Council Taylor. All those in favor? And that's carried. Okay. Uh, moving on now, and this is where I guess we could have some items to discuss. Um, we've got resolutions uh, 6 and 19. Uh, pulled. 
did I miss that? Oh, I'm sorry. So are there any changes to the council minutes? Or corrections, rather. Okay, so that was for the regular August 22nd minutes. Um, they've been circulated to you in the changes uh, to the agenda package as revised. If there's not any, uh, sorry, if there's not any um, further errors or omissions uh, respecting those or the minutes of the emergency or special council meetings. Uh, thank you, Mayor Chop. I'd like to go ahead and pull um, the community, the RFAB minutes, which are in the new agenda. They are items found on item 8E. That's still, it's still coming up. Oh, s sorry, I thought we were dealing Just with the this. Just the council, council emergency and special council meeting minutes. Okay, seeing none, the minutes are declared adopted and will be signed by myself and the clerk. Uh, now we're moving on to the reports of committees. So first, uh, the council and committee minutes um, open and close from September 3rd. The revised CIC minutes have been circulated uh, for you in the changes to the agenda package. And I have a motion to approve, uh, moved by Councillor Rabbits and seconded by Councillor Guys and all the balance except for items 6 and 19, which are pulled for further discussion. Any other comments? Councillor Michelli? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just one uh, small correction. Um, in our agenda package on page 46, item number 22, it indicates that the mover of that uh, motion was Van. I believe that's to be Van Passen. If we leave it at Van, that could be any one of hundreds of thousands of Dutch or Belgian people. I think council knows there's only one councillor Van Passen. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, all those in favor? And that's carried. Uh, moving on to item number six, and that's uh, the staff, there's staff report CS19-21 regarding the uh, award for request for proposal uh, for the fire dispatch services. Is there some discussion? Was that councillor Van Passen that you pulled that? I did uh, request it be pulled because I do believe that contract runs out shortly and I'm not sure there is time to send it back for more reports and more reports. So we might have to deal with it in a little different way and approve the contract and then uh, carry on with some further discussion on how to make it better next time. But I'm sure staff have some more input. I thought we were going to look into seeing whether or not we could extend it by a couple of months. It just seems to keeping the situation we find ourselves in that the contracts kind of come forward right when they're it's too late to do anything through the chair um, if, if it's of any benefit um, I did offer to do an objective review of the proposals um, they were sent to me uh, along with the scoring criteria and so I did have an opportunity to do uh, an objective review of both the quality scoring and the price scoring of both uh, proposals and I would say that I would concur with uh, the staff recommendation that was put forward in terms of uh, both quality, the bid price, and uh, the price per unit that was outlined uh, in, the, in the document I thought was clear and uh, was followed in terms of uh, scoring those proposals. So I think, I mean, part of this was the concern that I had raised from the email from staff. And just so we're clear, it's not questioning the um, the quality of the bid or that evaluation piece, but I actually just had the opportunity to speak with a number of um, our firefighters again over the Friday uh, the 13th um, day, and I'm still hearing rumblings that people have concerns about the work that was being um, supplied by St. Catharines. Um, they see there as being better changes, better structure that could have been made to the agreement so you know I mean if we have to go ahead with it now because we don't have a choice that's one thing but I think it's not just a matter of who's the lowest bidder in this case it's the fact that there has been some dissatisfaction with the provider and this is where I think that the frontline staff and our volunteer firefighters uh, really need to be consulted to 
to understand their concerns, and especially on the, on the volunteer side of things. If we're, our volunteers need to be happy here as well in this, and, and I don't think they felt that they were heard in this last round. Through the mayor, my, my only comment is um, <clears throat> the district chiefs do sit on a number of RFP uh, proposals and things as, as they come along. And in this case, uh, two district chiefs were chosen and, and carried through what we thought were the, uh, for the volunteers' uh, thoughts and concerns on this. To answer Councillor Van Passen's question, yes, this current uh, tender uh, does end at the end of the year. To, um, to set things aside, we would have to, uh, to be sure that we do have an extension on that, and staff have not reached out because there were still debate and deliberation uh, at this, this, this level where, where they're going to go forward. But we are out of contract December 31st, so you are correct. If not passed, we would have to hopefully get an extension with the, with the current company. Thank you, Madam Mayor, because that would be one of my concerns. It's not like you can't just turn off a switch December 31st and turn another one on January 1st unless um, you give them some warning. There is infrastructure. If you were to change who holds a contract, there's infrastructure. They would have to change. There's a lot of things. It's not like we can wait till the 15th of December and say, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll take that one or we'll take that one. There's a bit more lead time involved. And, I'm not sure we have that much lead time left because it's uh, what mid September. That's not that far away. So. Through the Mayor to County Council, uh, Councillor Van Passen is correct. We don't have time for a uh, to put do the process again and award the tender for December 31st. Staff are recommending probably a six month extension to be allowed to to depending on what council's direction is on the RFP. If we put a hold you know, RFPO, we'd have to definitely work on the scope, and that's going to take time to make the new document plus close. And as well, um, Councillor Van Passen is correct, if, a, if another company does get it, there is that setup time where they have to come in with their infrastructure. So we're recommending a minimum of, of, of six-month extension. Councillor Clemens. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, following last uh, Council and Committee meeting when this was uh, raised, I did uh, speak to Shelley Darlington who's involved with the procurement processes like this, and also Bill. And we have 11 district chiefs. And actually, this process started way back in May, I believe. We're only getting it now. but And uh, we have 11 district chiefs, and two of them apparently were appointed to this committee to be involved with the process of uh, hiring this dispatch service or scoring them. So I questioned Ms. Darlington on it as to whether the proper process was followed. She assured me that it was, and uh, as we heard from the CAO here, uh, he also has indicated that due diligence has been followed. So I'm prepared to uh, accept it for the, for the term that, uh, that we're looking for. I think uh, we have to have some trust in our people, and I think uh, it's, it's the right thing to do. Okay, so we're clear. I received an email from one of our district chiefs. So it's not questioning staff or I don't question whether or not the bid process was followed correctly or the procedure that we have used in the past. But we made a significant change in our fire department recently as a response to, at large, our volunteer firefighters. So when I receive an email from a district chief, one of our volunteers, that tells me that he feels that he had input to provide in this process and the report specifically stated that the district chiefs were consulted and he says I was not consulted that's where all I'm saying again it's not a criticism of the bid process it's not that something wasn't followed it's just that we've made a commitment that we're going to involve our volunteers more we're going to listen to them and listen to their frustrations so that it kind of becomes that grassroots you know firefighter situation again so I don't mind you know, as well, I don't, it's not a matter of not wanting to approve it or that I even know enough to speak intelligently about which dispatch service is better than the other one. I have no idea. But what I do know is that a district chief expressed concerns to me, and as a district chief in Norfolk County, I feel like he deserved to be listened to. And I, too, know where the district chief's concerns came from. I know who the individual is. And I was told that all that was resolved and that they agreed in the end that we did follow the appropriate process by appointing two district chief um, uh, people to this committee 
to follow the right process. And I think it's happened. So Thank would you. would you not say in that conversation with him that he there was some frustrate that maybe that committee should be bigger in the future? Perhaps. Perhaps, but I'm prepared to support what was presented to us at the council and committee meeting. Okay. Did you want to second that motion then? Um, yeah, thank Madam Mayor. Um, I think it happens once in a while. I agree with Councilor Columbus, but uh, I think uh, we're tying two issues together that are not necessarily linked here. I think there's bigger issues to deal with the volunteers, and this just happens to be sort of the place where they had a chance to vent. And I think uh, I've talked to a lot of the volunteers as well. There is a little shift going on in some of the thinking within the members. But And I talked to Councillor Michelli before the meeting today that uh, I wonder if the possibility exists to sort of have a, a fire department liaison committee that, like currently the, the district chiefs meet at a regular basis, but maybe a council member could be appointed as a, a liaison to that committee and sit in on their meetings and get a little feedback back and forth between the volunteers and, and this council rather than strictly through paper reports that go up the ladder and back down the ladder. And But I think we're looking at a bigger picture thing here, not just the issuance of a tender and a contract for the to renew the contract with the same uh, dispatch service that we've had in the past. So I think we, I could, would second a motion and uh, go ahead from there. Okay. Any further discussion from anyone? All those in favor? And that's carried. Okay, item. So um, just, just for councils, because it wasn't published, just for the public, uh, is it all right if I just quickly yep. read it out? That staff report CS 1921 award of request for proposal CS F 1901 fire dispatch services 2020 to 2024 be received as information and that the general manager community services be authorized to execute a contract with the corporation of the city of St. Catharines for a period of five years with an option in favor of Norfolk County to extend the agreement for one more additional term for up to three years and further that the approved 2019 capital budget be amended as outlined within report CS 1921. Okay. Uh, moving on now to item 19, staff report PW 19-55, Booth Harbor Water System Public Consultations. That was um, Councillor Van Passen. You had pulled that? Madam Mayor, I pulled it so I can leave and you can approve it so I'm not approving it as part of the whole set of minutes. Okay. Um... I think by the time we get out the door, we could be done. Somebody like to uh, move to approve those minutes? Uh, Councillor Rabbits and seconded by Councillor Michelli. All those in favor? That's carried. Councillor Van Passen, you're good. <laughs> I think our budget's been used up. Uh, public Hearing Committee, uh, September 10th, 2019. No items have been pulled from the Public Hearing Committee minutes. Uh, the revised minutes are before you. Are there any errors or omissions? I can have a motion to approve them. Oh, sorry, motion moved by Councillor Rabbit, seconded by Councillor Columbus. All those in favor? And that's carried. The Norfolk Environmental Advisory Committee minutes, August 12th. Uh, the NEAC August minutes are before you for information. Any discussion on those? Councillor Columbus. Yes, Madam Mayor. I'm looking at page 56 of the agenda package, and it's uh, a motion there at the bottom with respect to a permit issued for tree removal. And I got a, the question I have perhaps to Mr. Cridlin is if somebody wants to cut one or two trees down on their property, they don't have to really ask for permission, do they? We don't have a bylaw against that. Through the mayor, councillor, or council, councillor Columbus. No, um, unless it's um, the hectare or uh, um, no, a sing single trees have had no protection in yards, no, no bylaw, anyways. So why are we looking at this particular application where perhaps a few trees have to be removed? It's not a hectare or an acre. You're on page 56, councillor. Page 56 of the big package, page two of three of the report. Okay. I'm right just, at the bottom. Yeah, I'm just trying to catch up. So you're, you're at the part that says that staff be requested to determine through the forest department if there were permits issued for the removal of the trees. Am I in the right section? 
Right, it, it's right at the bottom there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I believe that was an action item to um, obviously to Adam Biddle from from the planning staff, and um, I, I don't have what answer Adam had got back. However, I, I take it it was favorable or had been taken taken care of up to this point. Best I can do now, because I'm sure there are a lot of trees cut, even though you know they're great trees just for one or two trees for development. I don't see it being that big a an issue. Thank you, Councillor Columbus. Um, if I could just follow up, actually, on, on this piece as well. So you just said that was an action from uh, to Adam Biddle from planning staff. What concerns me about this committee is, so were these actions then Mr. Biddle went and, and followed this direction from this? This is an advisory committee to council, and so if any of these motions, when we read this, we want to act on them, council pulls the motion and approves the motion. So just because the advisory committee has suggested something doesn't mean that staff has direction from the advisory committee to go and do so. And this is one committee in particular that I'm, I think I'm kind of seeing this more and more often. And I, I, like it's, also surprised me as to the number of staff members actually that attend this meeting again it's an advisory committee to council that is meant to be citizen driven with recommendations to council that we may or may not choose to act upon so i'm just wondering if you because i have a feeling that these these items were actually acted on but there wasn't any direction from council to act on them through, through the mayor I, I i totally understand what you're saying i know some of the um uh, advisor groups I sit on we, we do have motions or we'll make sure that's a motion that goes to council and some of the lesser things as action items staff do go on I just I, not being on that committee or where this fits in I'm not sure but a lot of um, smaller fundamental things obviously I don't think come to council and I, I just can't comment on, on, on this comment without, without being there Chris perhaps you might be able to look into this for us because in this committee in particular I see in fact one of the committee members um, that I spoke with uh, recently at one of the NFA uh, meetings had sort of expressed some concerns with kind of the committee and how direction was being taken again it's meant to simply be an advisory um, uh, committee to council and so it concerns me that I hear that staff is taking action based on those directions through the chair yeah we can certainly follow up on that and ensure there's clarity of the staff role in those advisory committees and then also the clarity around the movement of any action items or recommended action items be uh, channeled back towards council uh, in the minutes so we'll look into that Councilor Martin thank you mayor chop just further to, to that point I think it's a great opportunity to draw some attention to the fact that um, it's great that our staff are participating on committees and advisory committees and sometimes especially with our fab they're vital um, but what I don't want to see happen is conversation be influenced I would rather see the, the citizens that we've handpicked to sit on these com committees drive the conversation um, and you know to your to your point mayor chop about um, staff giving a uh, an action item to connect with another staff member um, it, it seems as though that that direction is being led by staff uh, which is I would agree concerning we want to leave it to the citizens to drive the the input on these committees Councilor Michelle. thank you madam mayor and uh, I'm just kind of looking around council chambers right now and I'm not sure that anybody will be able to answer this question about about these minutes of this particular meeting but I when I was reading through it I noticed that in uh, on our agenda package page 56 which I think is where we already are under other business um, mr. Schuyler uh, was in there as uh, making some uh, suggestions regarding the uh, this committee and uh, it it then goes on to indicate that Mr. Schuyler's suggestions were going to be deferred until the next meeting. I guess my question is, I also noticed that Mr. Schuyler was absent with regrets from that meeting. So I'm just wondering if I, if it's somehow, and I may have to ask the clerk or perhaps our CAO to determine whether or not the suggestions were in print in Mr. Schuyler's absence and were deferred on that basis, 
or if there's some kind of an error in the attendance on that committee. If Thank I could you. jump in, well, I'm not sure on that component, but I'm actually hoping that Mr. Schuyler is going to bring the suggestions to uh, council for all of us to hear directly. Does that satisfy you for now? I think that. Yes, it does, Madam Mayor. I just was a bit confused. I thought I, I think didn't it, know was if it was probably an error added in as an agenda item because he had intentions to do so, and then when he wasn't there, it was still in the agenda. So they just added that to the minutes. And so we should expect to hear it then. I'm hoping so. Okay, thank you. Passed. Okay, so if I have a motion moved by Councillor Geisen and seconded by Councillor Columbus that the Norfolk Environmental Advisory Committee minutes of August 12, 2019, be received as information. All those in favor? And that's carried. Uh, so again, I don't believe that any of those motions have been pulled from there and endorsed uh, by council. Um, the next now is Councilor Martin. You're up with the um, Recreational Facility Advisory Board. Actually, the first set of minutes from August 26 are okay. I'd like to talk about the September 6th. So if you want to approve the first one or do you want to do them both together? Uh, so uh, the first one I have before me is that the Recreational Facility Advisory Board uh, recommends Norfolk County Council to direct staff to enter into a contract with a Project 60 return to top manager to lead the all, for, all Norfolk Community Hub project. Um, I think that in the correction, it's in the second set of minutes, I believe. I'm not sorry, Mayor Chop. I'm not seeing that in the first set, but I... Um, in the second set of minutes from the September 6th meeting, I do have, if you want me to go ahead with those, I'll do sure. that. Um, it's on, found on page 66 of our agenda, and it's also in the correction. Um, the committee has decided that they would like to provide council and staff with recommendations to move forward, uh, keeping the project flowing, and staff can pull from it uh, what they need, and so we're not limited with our new uh, council agenda. So the first motion is that the RFAB um, recommends Norfolk County Council to allow staff to enter into a contract with any professional services company that may be required to assist in completing the funding application. Uh, I'd like to put that motion out on the floor today. Um, the second, that the rec uh, RFAB recommend Norfolk County Council to direct staff to enter into a contract with the architectural firm to begin preliminary design for the purpose of the application. And the third, that Norfolk, uh, sorry, rec RFAB recommend that Norfolk County Council direct staff to begin working on the RFP for architectural services for the final design. So again, these are the next um, few steps, the next two steps certainly that we believe we need to take uh, as the board to give that direction to staff. And the first motion is very broad and vague and it allows staff to engage uh, into professional services as they see fit. And um, Mr. McQueen, spoke about that at the RFAP meeting. So are you moving all three motions? Is that what's happening? Okay, and is there a seconder? Councilor Taylor, further discussion? Councilor Van Passen? Could you separate those three motions, please? Sure. So the first one is that the Recreational Facilities Advisory Board, RFAP, recommends Norfolk County Council to allow staff to enter into a contract with a professional services company that might be required to assist in completing the funding application. I, I need to ask staff, there is a budget set aside for that. I think it's out of the 2018 budget. That is there funding left in there and, and in what level? Through the chair to Councillor Passon. Yes, there is. Uh, I don't know the exact dollar amount. Perhaps our finance folks could look that up. It's it's north of 100000 I believe, is left in that account. Councillor Martin. After reading that motion, I may even want to uh, include that it be brought back to the mayor prior to hiring any or in initiating any particular contract. But the intent is to just uh, give staff the ability to keep the project moving forward. So instead of giving them carte blanche, maybe they can come to you or Mr. Uh, McQueen and discuss those services. So just to Councillor Martin's point, the funding applications close on November the 12th. So just that we're getting tight on timelines and need to get everything put together at this point. So do you want that addition then to that? Is that an amendment you've added? Okay. Um, so you're still good. Any further discussion? All those in favor? 
and that's carried. The second one now is that the Recreational Facilities Advisory Board uh, recommends Norfolk County Council to direct staff to enter into a contract with an architectural firm to begin the preliminary design for the purpose of the application. Now have we, Council Martin? If we're gonna break them up, I'm happy to speak on this one particularly. Uh, comments coming from staff with regards to design build or design bid build um, and the RFP process and the duration that it would take to acquire an architect. Um, we're not sold that we necessarily need this for our application, but it was to begin the process um, because it's, it's not an overnight hire. Councilor Columbus. Well, do we know exactly what structures we're going to need in this facility? If we're going to hire an architectural firm, I take it there must be some talk already somewhere about what buildings you want designed by an architect. I, and, I would agree with that, and I also think that, like, the architect is fundamental in this, and I think that this should be sort of a council-driven decision as opposed to simply a direction at this point in time, unless any further comment there? Well, I just feel, the, I mean, the selection of an architect is, I mean, that has huge implications with this project. And I'm just, how detailed of designs do we require? So through the chair, in reviewing the application, the application actually doesn't require us to provide very detailed uh, drawings. Uh, it's just more about a preliminary design. So I think the idea of getting the architectural firm was, would be to help us shape the components of that uh, facility. So whether there's aquatics, gymnasium, common space, uh, circulation areas that would be um, fitting to whatever the building code is, AODA standards, and a number of other things, but was just to get preliminary design drawings so that it would help to um, confirm the size of the components that would be in the building, costing based on recent Ontario builds. So we would have uh, a better knowledge and a better estimate on what that uh, facility could look like um, to, to make sure that we're fitting it to whatever the requirements are in the grant application. So it was not to get too far down the road which is why I think the third resolution was brought forward, which is further down the road, but it was to get documents prepared to be shovel ready with architectural drawings once we had a better idea of what council wanted in the facility. So the preliminary design drawings was uh, for the purposes of a relatively short time frame to get just some conceptual drawings done uh, to assist with the application. Councilor Van Pazen. Thanks, Van Mayor. Um, What's the difference between hiring or entering into a contract for professional services company to assist in the funding application and then hiring an architectural firm for the purpose of the application? Maybe we just put plural on the first one, but um, I don't think it's that complicated to figure out. We want to do a funding application. Those applications are capped at $50 million. Um, I think our staff already have numbers on an arena costs so much per square foot, a swimming pool costs so much a square foot, uh, on a therapy pool, a recreational heated pool costs so much a square foot, the senior center so much a square foot. We don't even know what it is we want yet. Once we decide what we want, or, well, sorry, um, council's not been informed of what we want yet. Um, do we really need to hire an architect when we can piece together, here's where we want to have a pool, we want to have an arena, an ice pad, a track, a senior center, this and that, it's going to cost $50 million to get the application done. And if they say no, we don't need an architect, if they say yeah, then we can get one. So uh, I'm almost thinking this motion is premature. Mm, I might push back on that one, actually, because, I mean, we already know, and certainly you know from uh, the meeting you attended, that this is going to be an extremely competitive process, that uh, there are a number of applications uh, that are all going in for this limited pool of money. And so whatever we can do, if it's a matter of spending a few thousand on an architect to be able to prepare the most competitive application possible, 
I think that that's worthwhile. I misread that one myself. I understand now that was for the preliminary design. I sort of I missed that word in there, and I thought we were engaging the architect for the full process, and that kind of concerned me. But um, now I just see it's for this initial piece. Councillor Martin, and then Councillor Rabbits. Thank you, Mayor Chop. Through you, um, Norfolk County already has some concepts that we took to AMO, and uh, um, I don't. They're lovely and they serve the purpose, but we didn't drill down on them enough to to sell a project for funding down the road. Uh, so that's why I would advocate for something a little deeper, something a little more personal and true to Norfolk County's roots. Um, exactly what Mayor Chop just said is, is my fear as well. It's very, very competitive. Uh, at AMO, I met with a lot of municipalities. They were lined up in the hallway to hand over their portfolios and their projects with these pictures and designs already done. And Guelph just pulled out of their council meeting last night with a $60 million library. They're going to be applying in the exact same um, funding envelope that we are. So I think we need to check all the boxes and be ready and, and cover it. Um, and I think it's a great way to take an architectural firm out on a trial run and see if they can get our vision and work with us uh, in some preliminary concepts instead of locking in long term with someone we've never worked with before. So. I would still, uh, I would still push for this. That's right. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Through you, uh, I am in support of the motion in principle. I think it's good for us to engage early on with an architectural firm um, to start some preliminary research in the project. We've budgeted some money that is north of hundred thousand dollars. I'm not too sure if Kathy and our finance team have had an opportunity to um, determine how much money is left in that bucket. Um, I would invite you at this point in time maybe just to, to confirm that number w with council. I think that would be prudent for us also to share that information on an ongoing basis with our FAB so they're aware of how much money we have in exploratory and consultancy uh, funding. I would feel much more comfortable if the mayor would have, uh, if we could entrust our mayor to have final signing authority on that just so we don't have a ballooning cost. Uh, through a consultancy where all of a sudden we have a surprise $50,000 bill, $60,000 bill, and we've spent all of our money that we've budgeted uh, to investigate um, what this hub concept could look like for our application. So at this point in time, I'd invite Kathy maybe just to mention how much money's left, and I'd, I'd be hoping that maybe uh, you'd be amenable to including some of that language just so that we can meet our timelines and we can entrust a member of council, our mayor, uh, to have that final authority so we, we can control these costs. Through the Mayor to Council, um, the actual approved budget for pre-construction is 200000 and we have paid thir approximately 30000 to date. If there's any outstanding um, purchase orders or invoices that haven't been uh, paid to date, I, I don't have that information. But so if the, uh, And it is funded from uh, it, some funding, Invest in Ontario funding, that we've had, had set aside, and uh, 50000 from the Legacy Fund. I guess the only other comment that I just would make to this is, Councillor Martin and I just um, uh, had a meeting, actually, um, uh, with um, Katie Buck and uh, she brought in I can't wait to share it with council but the most amazing sketches that were done uh, once upon a time in a citizen uh, sort of led group um, but it was largely done by students and they, they are the most uh, amazing concepts and designs and it's like how this has been hidden for this long I don't know but it almost brought tears to my eyes um, for Dover so uh, I think it's really important in the selection of the architect that we're not just going for the biggest name architect that's out there, that we have somebody that's really like willing to push the envelope here and not just do the traditional. And uh, I don't even know if that means maybe reaching out, you know, again, to, to a school to see. I mean, because we're just talking about preliminary concepts. so. There may even be a student that could be hired that would be kind of willing to do some of this work. So I don't know if there's a way that we could. Councilor Martin? Maybe I could, through you, Mayor Chop, uh, to Mr. McQueen, maybe I can pose this as a question to you. Our fab spoke about project manager and wrapping that position in, into um, an architect. 
I guess we could still go ahead with the project manager under the professional services company and then stray from architect and look at a student, right? I was thinking that we were going to look at wrapping both of those jobs into one from Mr. Shoemaker's suggestions, but we could, I've answered my own question, we could get a project manager through our con the contra uh, professional services. So through the chair, um, in terms of the architectural firm to do the preliminary drawings, I think for the purposes of the application, there will be some subject matter expertise and experience we'll be expecting from a firm, maybe not necessarily an architectural firm, just to outline specific components of that facility, whether it be mechanical, electrical, layouts, and other things that may impact the square footage or that may impact the cost per square foot. And I think that was in terms of a preliminary design, some of the elements we'd be looking to a more professional firm for, but um, to take your point about on the creative side of what that might look like, I don't think we've closed the door on that. It just may not be as part of the this uh, specific procurement, but I think there may be opportunities to incorporate um, some creative ideas at some point in the project. Maybe we would, could look at something joint then over the next month where we have a firm that's perhaps engaged more on on the you know square footage requirements and mechanical requirements but then i think and again to make us competitive and stand out we need to the creative component is critical because that's what they're going to look for is how we're differentiating ourselves more so than specific square footage requirements and without being too harsh i wasn't the last round wasn't quite as creative perhaps as i had imagined it would be so I still think that there's room to push the envelope even further on that. Okay, so uh, Councilor Martin has a motion on the floor and Councilor uh, Rabbits had an amendment uh, to that. And uh, so you're seconding the motion. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, noted. Um, and uh, finally is the last one that the Recreational Facility Advisors Board recommends Norfolk County Council to direct staff to begin working on the RFP for architectural services for the final design. So maybe you want to speak on this one again. The only hesitation on my part would be the fact that we don't know whether or not we're going to do design build or so on and so forth. I don't know if that's the best use of the time right now. I was just going to maybe... Um Perhaps I could come back at the next yeah, meeting. Yeah, I wonder, I w well, I wonder if, I don't know the ins and outs of the process, but if, if Ms. Darlington can just simply be directed to get it rolling, I mean, I don't know how helpful that is or time consuming it is, but the, the, this motion was driven out of concerns for um, the duration of time it would take to create an RFP, put it out and come back and have someone ready to go, knowing that if we uh, receive funding we need to start the, we're expected to start the project soon after, but uh, I don't think it needs to go out even, I don't know. So what if we did this, what if we brought this, this last one back at the next council meeting? And perhaps um, it might be uh, advantageous to have um, Mr. Burgess speak to this in terms of some of the benefits with the design build and one way over another before Shelly, I mean, right now there's so much going on before she dedicates time to doing this until we know that that's actually the route we're gonna do. It's just a matter of one meeting. Does that work? Okay. Okay, so um, am I all good or do I need another motion? We've done each of two of them. Okay, uh, so we'll receive the minutes from the August 26th uh, Rec uh, Advisory Board meeting as information. Moved by Councilor Martin, seconded by Councilor Van Passen. All those in favor? Yep. I was looking at these, both of these sets of minutes and right at the very end of each meeting, right at adjournment, it talks about um, on page 62, it was moved and seconded that the Special Rec Facilities Advisory Board meeting of March 18th, 2019 be adjourned at 6.54. And then the next set of minutes, 
it's got that the Special Recreation Advisory Board meeting of March 18, 19, 2019 be adjourned. So I'm wondering, was there not any meetings between March 18th and the last meetings that we've had? And okay, why would they both be Council the, the same date? I can help you with that through the through the mayor to Councillor Columbus. Uh, it's actually in the changes to agenda um, correction section because the revised uh, correction of dates listed in the motion to adjourn were incorrect. But the me the meetings are monthly, and actually on, on two occasions we've had uh, two meetings a month. Um, so it was just an error in our agenda. Thank you for that. I didn't have a chance to look at the changes here. Thanks, Councillor Van Basten. I do have a question. Those two motions that we just passed, um, there is no need to give authority to uh, waive our procurement policies. Like there, whatever you're going to do is going to be under um, the budget where department heads or whatever are allowed to enter into agreements with your contracts or anything like that. And they don't have to be tendered out and all those things. I think that's what we just did with the language in that. That would be my understanding. We're good. Yeah. Through the chair to council, I, I agree with Councillor Van Pass and um, staff will um, like, well, we will not be in adherence to the purchasing policy depending on these prices. So. It, it, I guess, is up to the group if, if you feel it is inferred in here or that is the direction within there. Uh, we're fine with it. We need to know that we have the ability to do that or if you want to add something in there about the purchasing policy, uh, I, I think that that's not a bad idea. I think it was inferred in the language myself. And then we just added the additional part, though, from Councillor Rabbits was that I would have the, uh, the authority on that. If it, if it doesn't... Heard. I'm just trying to think of what Shelley would say. I'm trying to channel Shelley, and I, I think I think Shelley would really appreciate it if council would just pass a motion to say that council approve an exemption to the council's purchasing policy for the resolutions uh, arising out of RFAB. Moved by Councilor Taylor, seconded by Councilor Rabbits. All those in favor? Gary. Okay, so, and the next minutes are that the revised minutes of the Recreational Facility Advisory Board meeting of September 6th be received as information moved by Councillor Michelli, seconded by Councillor Geisens. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, next up is the Delhi BIA minutes of August 15th. Uh, it's been moved by Councillor Michelli that they be received as information and seconded by um, Councillor Taylor. All those in favor? Carried. And now I believe we're moving on to our first staff report. The staff report 19-56, uh, the award of contract for the scale replacement at Simcoe Transfer Station. Mr. Godby. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Through you to Council. Uh, purpose of this report here tonight uh, is essentially we have two asks. Um, uh, the, the background being that uh, the scales at the Simcoe Transfer Station uh, do need to be replaced. We are uh, experiencing uh, ever-increasing uh, issues with the, the scale there that uh, now the maintenance and repair required to keep it operational is uh, becoming uh, a hindrance to us. Uh, essentially, we had requested a budget and council approved that budget of $50,000 for the scale replacement. It was a 2019 approved project. Uh, as we did more investigation within this, um, into the scales uh, and it was actually looked at, it was essentially determined that that budget would be insufficient in order to complete the work properly. Um, basically, the, the $50,000 was only taking into account the actual scale technology itself, not the undercarrying supporting structure of the actual scale itself. So uh, we had three, three different um, contractors that looked at it. All of them unanimously recommended that we would be best off to do this additional work at the exact same time. 
Otherwise, we will likely be back trying to do a repair on a new scale uh, understructure within the next couple of years. So, in order to get this work accomplished as quickly as possible, our two requests of council are one to increase our budget from the approved fifty thousand dollars to one hundred nine thousand dollars and two to provide an exemption from our purchasing policy which would allow us to not issue a formal tender but rather we would do more of an informal quotation process which would allow us to turn around this uh, work a lot quicker and basically get the job done before the end of the year uh, so we can not be pouring concrete and those kind of uh, construction issues in the middle of winter. I will gladly entertain any questions. Councilor Columbus. Mr. Gobby, your report says that the scale will be closed for three to five days. Where will the uh, people be taking their solid waste, trash, recyclables? Uh, through the mayor to Councillor Columbus, that is an excellent question. If uh, this scale is taken out of uh, out of commission for a period of time, our, our South Walsingham transfer station will also remain open, um, and we would encourage people to to use that in that time period. If not, uh, we would request that they could um, maybe just wait a week, let us get things back in order and and operational. What's the plan to get the word out to advise people of the changes? Uh, through the mayor to Councillor Columbus, uh, we will definitely, if if Council approves this, uh, us moving forward with this, once we have definitive construction dates, we would definitely engage our communications team to be able to make sure we get that word out that there are alternatives to the Simcoe transfer station that can be used, and that uh, they know the public knows when it will be out of service. When the 50000 was set aside for out of the um, solid waste reserve fund at budget time, was there an idea that we were going to need to replace the scale this year? Was that in part the reason for that 50000 being set aside? Uh, to you, Madam Mayor, the, uh, the 50000 was originally for that scale replacement. That, this was a planned activity that we were hoping to get done this year. The complicating factor was once they got underneath of the existing scale and looking at basically the supporting concrete structures underneath that, that hold that scale up, that was not factored in at that time. And that's more than the cost of the scale itself? Uh, to you, Madam Mayor, yes it is. Or was the scale more than 50000 the scale portion of it? The I'm just wondering, I, I just asked Jason, I mean, I know you weren't around at, 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 for that budget period last year, but we keep having a number as we go into budget time this year, we consistently seem to be under that number. And on something like a scale that's a piece of equipment should be one that I would hope would be relatively close to that budgeted amount because we have a general idea of what they're going for. But when it's more than double what the original approved budget was, that's when it's kind of like, how can we be so far off within we just approved the budget in the winter time? Uh, to you, Madam Mayor, the uh, very excellent points. I, I do believe that it was um, when that budget was established back, it would have been the end of 2018 uh, into the even as early as part of the summer. They did not anticipate the level of deterioration of that concrete substructure. Um, so essentially, they they had figured that within 50,000, the scale itself could have been replaced. And there was probably another, well, it's about another 59 in the actual concrete work that needs to be done. So that's so. really, so the scale itself is within the 50 and the concrete work is the 59? Yes, if we were to take this out to um, to tender for quotation without the increased budget, likely we could get the scale replaced within this fifty thousand dollar budget. However, uh, all three of the the contractors who have looked at this site do not recommend us putting a new scale on that structure. 
because in their professional opinion, they feel that we will be back trying to pull this new scale out and replace that understructure in a period of two to three years. Um, so they're, they're highly recommending that we do this now, which is why we've crafted this report in this time to take into account the full proper replacement of this, this scale. Um, and just subsequent to that, we do have, we have revised the future budgets for potential scale replacement in uh, South Walsingham to be reflective of the information that we now know better. So I appreciate your reasonings for wanting to waive the purchasing policy on that and moving ahead in timelines and so on. It just starts to get me a little bit nervous when we're looking at, you know, obviously a fairly sizable job and just we are still going to get some various bids on this. We're not just going to one contractor here. You're, you are going to reach out to multiple. Uh, to you, Madam Mayor, yes, that is correct. Uh, we will, it will be a public uh, advertised process. Um, it, it will be posted on the website that it is available. The contractors that uh, we have been in discussions with will be advised that we do have a bid. Doc it is a formal, informal bid document. Shelley would do a much better job of describing that exactly. No, okay. However, um, it, it is definitely is. We're not asking for a sole source. We're not asking to just choose okay. contractor A. We, we still want to receive competitive pricing. It's just we do know we need more money and we would like to get it done quicker. Council Member Hassan. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Uh, when I read this report, I think I had about the same questions. You know, for $50,000, you can pick up that scale, throw it out, put a new electric one in there, but you want it to upgrade to hydraulic cell technology, which is better in the long term. When they're looking under it, you got to replace the piers. Okay, if we're replacing the piers, we can do the washout pad at the same time. So we got the thing apart. Let's fix it right. Rather than do half a job three times, we'll do the whole job once. And that's uh, cheaper, right? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, to Councilor Van Pass, and that is a, a much better synopsis than I gave you. All of, uh, of essentially what we're asking for here. It, it is the time to do it and do it right, and then we will not have to worry about this structure for hopefully another 25, 30 years. So Councilor Michelli's moved that motion for you, and it's been seconded by, I believe, Councilor Taylor. Um, as printed, any further discussion? Oh, Councilor Rabbits. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and through you. I just had one more question for you, Jason. Um, it's all going to be driving from the solid waste reserve fund. Is that the only applicable reserve for capital investment in our transfer site locations? Is there any other reserves that could be applicable or drawn upon appreciating this is your expert recommendation? Um, but I'm just wondering for council's knowledge and for those at home, um, we're looking at an unaudited financial statement of well over a million dollars in deficit in this reserve fund. Uh, the projected balance uh, for 2019 based on our capital plan for 2019 uh, is in the ballpark of, of just shy of $5 million. And I was wondering if there is any other reserves or funding opportunities for our transfer site locations. Is this the only reserve that if we're looking to invest capital in a transfer site, it's got to come from the Solid Waste Reserve Fund? To, uh, Councillor Rabbits. Um, that is the only reserve that we do have set up for solid waste. Um, prior to this council, this um, it's went into a deficit to, um, for two reasons. Um, prior to this, there were um, large, uh, a lar an, a huge increase in the budget for solid waste um, when the Camber and the Tom House sites uh, closed. And our cost, I think that year was 2.2. The council at that time um, decided to withdraw or, or phase in the impact, levy impact, over four or five years. So that's one of the reasons why it's actually in a deficit at this point in time. But since there, since 2017, Council has uh, agreed to or rec they approved a recommendation to increase this reserve by 400000 annually. We currently contribute from the levy 367000 and that's been increased now to 767000 with the intention that we would look at it annually and make any kind of further recommendations based on our, our capital plans. You'll see over the 10 years, that was the plan to try and bring the reserve into a positive balance, but we, we definitely still need to continue monitoring it and having a look at it based on our capital needs. 
Thank you for that, Kathy. I appreciate that insight. Um, we have in our uh, agenda that we're looking to be in a positive balance by 2028. Um, it would be nice for council when we're receiving information specifically about a reserve that's in a deficit situation when we get to the break even point. I find myself that when I'm in a hole, I stop digging. Um, and it would be nice to know when we could maybe uh, find that, that, that break even point or that zero balance, appreciating that it, we may reach it well before 2028. Uh, and I imagine that would be the case if we're looking to increase the contributions to that reserve fund. So I'll be supporting the motion. I think it's in good order that it's a dig once type of policy. It makes no sense to go back, uh, remove a, a brand new scale, and then look at piers, and look at concrete work, and look at the, the washout or the, the ramp up or the landing to the ramp. So uh, it's something that I'll be supporting. Uh, just maybe some constructive criticism that when I'm looking at uh, a reserve fund that's in deficit, it would be really beneficial for us as council. Uh, to see what that break-even point would be, maybe even including those recent changes uh, for the contributions, because we'll be going into budgets very soon, and we do need to pay attention to our reserve funds, specifically those that are in a red balance. Um, again, if you find yourself in a hole, you, you got to start thinking about ladders. You can't, you can't keep digging. You can't grab yourself a shovel. Thank you, Councilor Roberts. Any further discussion on that? So again, motion was moved by Councillor Michelli and seconded by Councillor Taylor. All those in favor? And that's carried. Uh oh. He didn't want to tell her to break the window. Oh, okay. <laughs> Safe travels, Roger. Okay, so uh, next one is just uh, on the agenda is the, just a kind of a verbal discussion amongst uh, counselors. Um, I, not just through this weekend, um, but over time I've heard um, from different staff members, actually uh, various frontline staff members, I heard from a few throughout Friday the 13th festivities um, that either have frustrations or um, have felt uh, that they can't come forward and speak to uh, their council members. Um, or uh, even worse, I've heard uh, allegations um, that there were some staff members, uh, there has been no verification to this at this point. Um, it's just hearsay, um, but that have um, been fearful being identified as a, as a county employee. And I think that um, that is certainly not something that this council will tolerate. And I'm just wondering if it might be prudent at this point in time uh, to direct staff to bring back a, a report outlining some potential innovative methods to encourage uh, and enable employee reporting either of incidents or of misconduct or so on and so forth so that they can do so um, in a uh, sort of in a confidential, discreet manner and ensure that it's addressed. So anything further from council? Councillor Well, Madam Mayor, I recall, uh, was it 19 years ago? One of the things that was suggested was a suggestion box where people could drop their concerns into an envelope. Where that ever has gone or what's happened, I, I think there was a committee was supposed to look into that. And I don't know where it's been at, whether it's been implemented, or maybe the, the clerk knows, perhaps. Been a lot of changes in 19 years. Okay. Well, so maybe that, maybe that, that's, you know, as well, like to wrap suggestions into this too. So whether it's, you know, sort of a whistleblower type situation, as well as suggestions, as well as, you know, people wanting to sort of, um, you know, confide something that perhaps they might not have otherwise wanted to out in the open, whatever that may be. So whether it's a, a modern day version, electronic version, even of a suggestion box, um, something along those lines so maybe we could have staff bring back some suggestions for the next council meeting and we could move to implement something like that. Councillor Michelli. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I think the suggestion is a, is a very uh, timely one and a very, uh, much, very much needed. I know that uh, there have been some staff changes and perhaps some staff uh, are experiencing some anxieties and uh, you know perhaps some uh, some um, feelings of, of uncertainty about the future and I, I think that this would be a great way to uh, provide them with uh, I hope the confidence they need to speak out uh, about anything that they're concerned about and also to uh, to to feel and, and to know that uh, um, you know some of these um, recent staff changes uh, have have also created some anxiety for for council as well um, so we we know that uh, the feeling uh, that that can exist and, and I think that this would go a long way to uh, perhaps uh, restoring confidence uh, in in all aspects of the uh, working day for for all staff including council thank you thank you so much anything further so if um I'll just read this and if somebody wishes to move it um, would be that a report outlining potential innovative methods to encourage and enable employee reporting of incidents uh, suggestions and employee concerns being presented to uh, council and committee commit consideration for consideration of options moved by Councillor Martin seconded by Councillor rabbits all those in favor carried uh, now moving on to just Friday the 13th uh, debrief. Um, <laughs> I think Councillor Martin and I um, have heard a lot, as I'm sure staff have as well, of uh, concerns, um, everything from some of the towing that occurred that perhaps wasn't on streets that had previously occurred and so on and so forth. And so I'm just wondering, I know we had planned on some Friday the 13th uh, debrief meetings and when we were looking at uh, I guess holding uh, the Friday the 13th debrief meeting so we can just inform people and take their suggestions and be prepared for that. To the Chair of the County Council, yes, staff um, actually are still cleaning up from the last event. So I believe our emergency management folk, which are fire OPP and EMS, are meeting in the first part of October. And we are then with uh, roads, uh, parks, licensing, and that I believe we've, we've had to push it back until don't have the exact date. I think it's the 20th or 22nd of October just to get all the players at the field so uh, or at the table so we will be having our debriefs with within you know by the October 22nd date and that's kind of common what we do after a big event it takes takes a month to for each group to kind of look at what went right what went wrong what did people see and and staff will will be debriefing at that time council Martin Thank you, Mayor Chop. Through you, uh, I'd firstly like to start off by thanking our staff. I know that uh, especially public works and roads teams were out there at like 4 a.m. Thursday getting barriers and then back on Friday. And um, I actually read a funny comment online about a few ladies who live nearby Powell Park and they said uh, that the, the road staff, they were in Powell Park cleaning up Friday, Saturday morning, I'm sure, um, and they were a couple of guys, and they were just giggling to each other, having a great time. So they said it was kind of like, you know, silver lining of this community who's upset with all these changes, and and they, uh, instead of being awoken to a couple of uh, partyers or loud motorcycles, they were woken up and by some staff members who were having a great time cleaning up, and the community wakes up, and it's like it never happened. So. Kudos to all the staff, including fire and EMS. I just wanted to take this opportunity to make uh, a quick note to the public and staff that this council is certainly committed to making these changes to uh, keep public safety at the forefront. Was it the best possible arrangement that we could have had? No, I'm not convinced it was. Will there be more changes in the future? Yes, I'm sure there will be. Um, but we also made a commitment to sit down with our staff and with fire and EMS and police and go through this debrief process. So. Um, I would like to be involved in, in all of those meetings if I, if I can be. Um, and I know that our stakeholders, uh, Board of Trade and Kinsmen, have been uh, making notes that they would like to bring back and be included whenever that comes time to include them. So anyways, thanks to staff. And, and uh, my last comment would just be, I keep hearing about, I'm actually bombarded with this infamous bacon fest in Lucan. Is this something that our staff can uh, look up and see how they how they organize their event? I know they have a lot of bikes that come in. I know they've got like a, a safety guard where the bikes can drive and pedestrians could walk on the other side or safety vehicles could travel on the other side. Could we just please make a note of that? I hear great things out of that event. 
I think um, I think it's been a big learning experience for all of us, even as our this council's first Friday the 13th, and at least now we have a little bit of a breather until the next one, and can be better planned and understand how um, how we can sort of work to, together more with staff moving into the next next one, and and taking the concerns of our residents, and hopefully bring in some 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 minor adjustments for the next one that that uh, might help everybody. Councilor Rabbits. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and through you. Um, I've received a few uh, calls and concerns about uh, the arrangement specifically with parking and uh, with the, uh, the parking of the bikes, bikes specifically. Um, and uh, I think a lot of folks are looking for some sort of compromise between what we put forward for this event and what's taken place in the past, appreciating that this was uh, likely one of the more safe events um, with uh, the arrangements that we had in place, but it might take away a little bit from the enjoyment of looking at the bikes the way that they were parked in previous events. Um, we had one of our largest ones uh, ever, July 13th. Um, that prompted a lot of uh, the changes due to the concerns with public safety. And we've got another hot weather event coming up in 2021 in August, and I think that's really the event that we're all driving towards, uh, likely going to have uh, the largest attendance that we've ever had, I would be anticipating. Uh, something similar that we had uh, in last year of, uh, of July, uh, the Friday the 13th. So I'm hoping that maybe we could also have, uh, in the interim, uh, provide an opportunity for a public to even appear before this council. I do know that we have a public hearings committee. I don't know if that would be an appropriate, um, appropriate opportunity for our staff report to come back and allow for some public feedback even at the podium in front of us here. Um, I know that staff are going to be in discussion with uh, those community members about how to make a better event, uh, but I might suggest having that uh, discussion take place in council chamber. And with the changes to the agenda, to me, it makes sense to have that meeting at a public hearings committee as opposed to a CIC or a meeting of council. But I'd be um, interested in what our staff's perspective uh, is uh, and maybe having uh, an opportunity for a discussion of that nature. Through the chair to the councillor. Yeah, I, I think one thing is, we, you know, we have a December event. We're less than 90 days away from our next Friday the 13th, and we're still picking signs up. So December, it will be a cold weather event. Uh, I have already reached out to one of the uh, stakeholders. They don't, ex at presently, they don't expect to be doing anything for the event, but we'll watch the forecast and meet with them. Then we go to March of 2020, which will be another cold one, followed by November of 2020, which we don't expect crowds. So, um, I, I, you know, obviously, the, the the more input we could get, people have it is good. However, I'm not sure the timing. I, I think we we do have some time in this because, as you mentioned, August uh, 2021 is the next big one. So we would start planning for that. Uh, you know, the fall of 2020 or even January of 2021. So so we we do have some time on that, and um, I'll get comments from from my staff as well as we debrief for this one because we're, we're not too worried about the next three Friday 13s. It is the big one in August, and uh, go from there. Councilman Passman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I too would like to say that staff did a great job because uh, by Saturday noon you could hardly tell anything happened in Dover because it was all cleaned up. And, and I know they're still scrubbing a few of the odds and ends, but um, I actually went down, took a walk through there in the middle of the afternoon on Friday. Um, didn't meet a whole lot of people that were happy. The new layout. Um, a lot of complaints about that because, believe it or not, one of the draws of Friday the 13th was to see the motorcycles. And you've got three blocks in the core with no motorcycles on them. You can see cool t-shirts and some little trinkets, or you could go over in the park and get something to eat. But you've separated everything so the bikes are over here and over here and over here and over here. But that's the people didn't come to look at the vendors or to look at the chip wagons. They came to look at the bikes, but they got to walk all the way up and down town to find out where the bikes are parked. So, you know, maybe this is something you should look at. Put the bikes back in the core and put the vendors and the food things on the fringes so somebody can stop here, get a bite to eat, buy a T-shirt. But the whole time they can see the motorcycles in there. Um, the other little complaint that uh, took a lot of flack over was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the police uh, sort of quit looking for residence passes and just let every car drive down into town. So every, where they're supposed to park, they park where it says biking parking only. 
uh, one-way streets don't mean anything anymore once the cars are going up and down and nobody was enforcing any of that and uh, it did become a little bit of a jumbled mess uh, by about four or five in the afternoon. Now luckily it rained and probably some people stopped showing up otherwise it would have got a lot worse. So there has to be a little bit more consistency on those rules or some enforcement on whether it's bylaw or the OPP sort of telling people that you're going the wrong way. But then again, I don't think there was any signage up that said that they were one-way streets for that day. Um, like maybe at the at the um, at the, the uh, intersection it was, but once you get that on that street going the wrong way, you're never going to see another sign. So you might have to follow up a little bit. Uh, maybe the, the bike parking only be one way, one way, one way as well. So. Um, now, uh, I think Mr. Crittenden summed it up best. We've now got three cold weather events in a whole year to try to tweak sort of the flaws that we found and, and get it fixed. And I'm sure that uh, 2021 is going to be fantastic again. So thank you. So I think um, I just mentioned to Mr. McQueen, um, actually, I like Councillor Rabbit's suggestion, and I think it's better I know the next big one is far away but sometimes it's better to just figure out our plan kind of what the challenges were and how we can fix them for the next one so we're not scrambling at the last minute for the next one so I just um, I think Chris maybe over the next before the next CIC meeting with staff maybe we could talk about how maybe we could structure that maybe it's just one an hour set aside at one of the council meetings if some members of the public do want to come and speak if that the public hearings committee if it's when we do a special debrief on a different day as a special council meeting, however that might look, maybe we could think about that and make a proposal to council at, at the next meeting. Does that work? Okay. That's all I have for that. Uh, so next is um, motion moved by Councillor Michelli and seconded by uh, Councillor Taylor that uh, bylaw 50Z 2019 and bylaw 53Z 2019 be approved, signed by the mayor and clerk, and affixed with the corporate seal. All those in favor? That's carried. Uh, there are no notices of motion that I'm aware of, unless there's anything on the floor. Nope. Any general announcements? Menu Councilor Rabbits. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Through you. Um, this weekend, on Saturday, the Waterford um, branch of the Norfolk County Public Libraries will be celebrating its 30th anniversary. Um, I believe the commemoration is going to commence about 10.30 a.m. Uh, so if you are a patron of the Waterford Library branch or if you'll be in the area, uh, pop on in and help them celebrate their 30th uh, anniversary. Uh, also, next weekend on the 28th, of September, all Norfolk County Public Library branches will be hosting um, a living book. You're able to uh, book out an individual who will tell you a story in about 15 minutes uh, of a subject matter of their choosing. Uh, we're hopefully we're going to get a broad swath of different uh, vocations and life experiences, and it's part of Norfolk County Public Library's effort to be more than just books. And we're getting into presentations, and I'll be participating at the Simcoe branch. You could book me out. Um, I'll be there from 1.30 p.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, sharing my experiences of growing up in Norfolk County in the 90s, um, going off to school in the 2000s, and coming back and looking for work in the 2010s and just my experiences and the changes I've seen in our community during those decades. But we're hopefully going to get more volunteers to sign up for this exciting event. And it's something that's uh, interesting that's going on in all of our branches across Norfolk County on the 28th of September. So hopefully we'll have a good turnout. And again, we are looking for volunteers. So if you think you have an interesting story, uh, please do engage with our library staff and uh, sign up for a time slot. Thank you. Anything further from council members? Um, I do have uh, one sad announcement to make, and I'm sure uh, many of our council members have, uh, and staff have already heard, but we did uh, last week have a passing of one of our staff members uh, in the roads department, Jeff Dudney. He was, um, he was uh, one of our valued members of the roads department, and he was a truck driver, I believe, in the east. Is that correct? Um, I didn't know, uh, I didn't have the opportunity to meet Jeff, but I don't know if you wanted to say anything uh, thank you madam mayor um, 
I, I personally did not uh, know Mr. Dooney, but uh, I can I can say that every one of the road staff and other other public works staff that I did speak to in the the days after, um, they were all very consistent on the the fact that uh, he was a very well liked guy. He was a hard working man, and uh, they will miss their uh, their friend and colleague. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Cridlin would want to say anything, knowing that his background as well. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, I um, I did grow up with Jeff in the community of St. Williams, played ball with uh, him and his family. We were very instrumental in the St. Williams ball, um, ball diamonds. And I think if it wasn't for the Dudney family, this ball wouldn't have been in St. Williams. Later into high school, Jeff and I did play football together. And yeah, he had started in public work soon after I had left the community services, so I didn't get a chance to work with him. But um, he had a heart of gold and, and was a super guy. Nothing bad to say. Well, on behalf of all of council, our condolences to his uh, friends and family. Um, I have uh, one other announcement uh, to make, and that is from the Norfolk Historical Society. They have a speaker series. And on Thursday, September the 19th, uh, it's titled uh, Finding My Birth Family, Miracles and Adult Content. Uh, Doug Grant shares with us the second part of his journey to find his birth family. Join us for a fascinating and heartwarming presentation. Members are free and guests are by donation. That's uh, Thursday, September the 19th at 7 p.m. at the Norfolk Public Library. And that, anything further from anyone? Okay, so I guess now we're going to uh, move into closed session and I have a motion moved by Councillor, not Councillor Geisens, he's not here, Councillor Rabbits, and seconded by Councillor Taylor that Council move into closed session at 5.03 uh, p.m. pursuant to sections 239.2 C and F of the Municipal Act 2001 as amended as the subject matter pertains to a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board and the receiving of advice that is subje subject to solicitor client privilege and including communications necessary for that purpose. All those in favor? And that's carried.
Okay, I have a motion. Um, may I have a motion to reconvene in open session? Councillor Rabbit, seconded by Councillor Taylor. All those in favor? And that's carried. Uh, and now the motion reads as follows that Council approve staff to enter into a six month sublease agreement with Lansdowne Children's Center and that the lease rates as described in the confidential HSS memo be approved and that Council approve the donations described in a confidential memo, confidential HSS memo. Moved by Councilor Rabbits, made by Councilor Taylor. Further discussion? All those in favor? And that's carried. And confirming bylaw. Uh, motion moved by Councilor Taylor, seconded by Councilor Michelli, that bylaw 2019 91 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of Norfolk County at this Council meeting held on the 17th day of September 2019. Be approved, signed by the Mayor and Clerk, and affixed with the corporate seal. All those in favor? Carried. And finally, the council be adjourned at 6.22 p.m. Councillor Michelli and seconded by Councillor Taylor. All those in favor? Council's adjourned.